Hi, this is Dan Moyle, the Inbound Evangelist, and you're listening to Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Welcome to Chasing Dreams Podcast with Amy J. Amy believes that realizing a life without regrets is achieved by taking chances, chasing your dreams, making moves, and overcoming your doubts. The Chasing Dreams podcast will help you overcome life's obstacles, believe in your potential, and inspire you to face your fears. And now here's the woman who is passionately pursuing her dreams, Amy J. Hey, Dream Chasers, this is Amy J, and you are listening to episode 110 of Chasing Dreams. How crazy is that? I know every episode is crazy, right? But really it is because I'm always amazed about the fact that one, I'm still podcasting. Two, you guys are still listening. This is fantastic. And I still get to meet and have wonderful new friends on the show. And today is no different. Today I have Dan Moyle, who promotes helpful, engaging marketing over interruptive advertising. Coming to marketing from the TV news business, Dan brings a wealth of knowledge from writing to video production to multimedia content creation. He says he'd rather help someone reach 50 ideal customers rather than 5,000 passive viewers, and he's a believer in servant leadership. Dan could be found behind the scenes at work with organizations like Talons Out, Honor Flight, and Interview Valet, lifting others up with a service and a strong work ethic. And we met each other at the latest podcast movement, 2017. And it was awesome. I, we were talking and I was listening to the story and I just like, hmm, yeah, okay. Do I just drop it in there that he has to be on the show? How do I make that happen? Uh, and I was like, you got to come on the show, man, because there's more to Tim than just marketing guys. It's an awesome story. And we're going we're gonna to learn more about that today because, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show and taking time out of your day to talk to us. Absolutely, Amy. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. It, it was it was fun talking to you. It was kind of that, you know, providential meeting of, oh, you know, Jamie J. Oh, yeah, so do I. Well, hey, you yeah. know what? We should talk. So that yeah, was really cool. So I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, it. whenever we run into these things and we're like, hey, and, and guys, it's literally Jamie J, not my sister, Jamie J. Confusing. <laughs> Former guest on the show, Jamie J. Uh, but yeah, it was a small world and he was there and we were talking I'm like, I can see how you guys are friends and now we're friends. And it's like, Okay. All right. Yeah. It's and a cool world, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And you have a cool story. So, because people here, you're, you're working with companies like Interview Valet, marketing, you're the inbound marketer or the inbound evangelist, I guess is the better title. But before that even happened, right? What was Dan Moyle's dream at the age of 13? Uh, my dream at the age of 13 uh, was to be a writer. I've been writing since, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't even remember when writing and drawing and being artistic and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and I remember writing poetry back in, you know, fifth grade, uh, all through middle school, just kind of journaling, uh, get into high school and I start writing short stories and song lyrics and whatever. And I thought I'm going to be a writer. And I didn't think necessarily the next great American novelist by any means, but I'm going to write. And that was, that was my dream for the longest time. And, and I, let me ask you something, because that, that's actually not a common thing for, for a guy to write poems or, and talk about it or, you know, art, you know, that kind of thing. Were you open about that in your teens? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, huh. um, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things I, I uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I guess it's not common. You're right. But it's kind of like, you know what? Uh, song lyricists, right? People write songs. I mean, you've got. You know, James Hatfield from Metallica is no, uh, you know, <laughs> poet per se, but he writes lyrics, right? So, yeah, I, yeah, I was always open about it, and and I just I love telling stories and and reading them too. So, and so, I mean, you're using writing in your job, but mm -hmm. what happened? I mean, at what point did you veer off the track, or did you put it to the side? Well, I mean, I. <laughs> I still consider myself a writer at my core. I mean, much of what I do, you know, as so I'm chief marketing officer at, at an agency called uh, Interview Valet. And certainly, you know, strategy and marketing and all these lofty things are, are part of what I do. But at the core of it, what I often do is I'll write something for someone. I'll say, hey, listen, I need an email. Here's what I'm thinking. 
I'll write it for them. They'll do a little editing and that's what I've done professionally. And so I, I certainly feel like I'm still living that dream. I'm very fortunate um, to be able to, but it's not, you know, when I, when I say to someone, I'm, I'm a writer, oh, do you have books? Yeah. Well, that's my oh, first thought. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and I do have a book, but it's not, it's not a bestseller by any means. It's more of a kind of an instructional, uh, you know, hopefully a, 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 an inspirational sort of book, but it's, you know, for me, I write constantly and I tell stories constantly. And that to me is what marketing is. And, and, and I, and I, I feel like I've chased my dream and I continue to, because I remember when I finally got into the professional world and, and I mean professional, you know, I, I'd had had jobs. We all have our first jobs, you know, waiting tables or bartending or, you know, mowing lawns or whatever. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. But when I finally actually had a career going on and it was TV news uh, journalism, I had moved my way up from being a production assistant into the producer chair and I did it through my writing. You know, I submitted writing samples to the news director and said, I can do this. And I, and I ended up with the job and was a producer for quite a while. But as I, as I sat there and watched that news world change, uh, and this was after 9-11, this was back in 2006, 2007, when I started to see it change. And mm -hmm. I just discovered Twitter. Twitter was brand new in 2008. And I hopped on and started playing around and meeting people. And I thought, man, this is a great way to develop an audience. And I never thought of it as marketing. But that I know was where the catalyst came was when I discovered Twitter and audience development outside of the newsroom but using the newsroom as a, as a, a subject. And, I, and it's kind of funny because I actually got in trouble for tweeting during my shift. Oh, really? <laughs> right. Yeah. And now they force you to be on Twitter as a reporter and that's not good either. But anyway, that's a story remember, for another time. <laughs> exactly. But uh, you know, I remember sitting in the newsroom thinking, you know, I, I really want, it's really time to move on. I, I want to get out of this. You know, my, my ego got in my way and I thought, man, I've got nine years of experience in in news. I'm, I'm good. And you know, a company like Kellogg, you know, that makes Frosted Flakes and, and whatever. They're over in Battle Creek, only 20 minutes away from where I'm at in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I thought, man, you know, a company like Kellogg, they're going to love me. I've got PR experience in mm -hmm. media and news and writing. They're going to love me. Well, it turns out not having a master's, not even having a bachelor's degree doesn't get you very far when they it comes to those that. corporations. <laughs> no. They didn't love that. <laughs> nope. So, so yeah, I ran into a brick wall there chasing my dreams. So yeah. And see, here's the thing. One, we were right. Earlier, you talked about how People ask about, you know, are you a writer of author books? That's that's where your head automatically goes. But you're you're showing that there's another type of writing that you love and you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be authoring books and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Do you still yeah, absolutely. do you still write poems though? I haven't written poetry in a long time, but I still kind of dabble with a little bit of lyrical writing. Uh, create. You know, it's I'd like to think of myself as a songwriter someday or maybe a, a TV writer someday. But I mean, honestly, the, the that creative side of things, I don't find the time for right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I have two kids. Uh, I have a full time job. I have some other passions that I follow, some volunteering that I do. And I just, you know, I don't write as much as far as that goes. So, you know, that part of me is kind of on hold right now, which I'm OK with. I've never kind of thought, gosh, darn it. I want to write poetry uh, in the last few years. So <laughs> it's OK. Yeah, see, and that's the thing, though, is that you're okay with that, and you're still doing what you love. Now, what's interesting that me, that you said also was, you know, you pursued a place, Kellogg's, you know, and the the lack of formal education, right? I mean, this world, I think, is so focused on formal education. It's hard if you don't go that route, but there, many people don't for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And so, what happened when you faced that? that brick wall there. I mean, there, obviously there's a way around it, right? The ladder is get a degree, but right. did you take that ladder or did you find a, a tree branch to climb over with? Yeah. And yeah, I didn't, didn't go back to school. Um, it was certainly an ego check, a bit of a gut check for me of, Oh gosh, none of these companies want to talk to me. Right? Okay. So I just, I just continued to, to do what I was doing. You know, you're desirable from an employer standpoint when you're already employed. Right. So I stayed with my job, yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> kept doing what I was doing, honing my skills, developing some skills in social media. I was helping to run our Facebook page for the news, uh, the newsroom and doing other things like that. And, and I was trying, and I was, I was thinking at the time, gosh, I could become a screenwriter mm -hmm. fr from any, anywhere in the world. I can start to write TV shows. So my my cousin, who's my writing partner, and I did a, a TV pilot and some other stuff, some other pr small projects. And I kept thinking that might be my route. So I connected with other young screenwriters on Twitter, young in the business. Um, and it was really interesting. It was a lot of fun. But I, I just kept 
kind of trying to find a way in this world of marketing, knowing that communications, marketing, PR, sales needed content and stories. And fortunately, uh, at the same time, my, my network around me, someone else was looking for that person, that particular kind of TV news producer or writer that has video experience. And they knew of me and we connected and I ended up being courted into a new career of marketing. And I did that with a, a regional mortgage banker. So you want to talk about going from boring to boring, from news to mortgages. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still chasing that dream of writer. I mean, I knew going in that I'd be the the blog writer, the, the website developer, the social media person. I knew that I could still continue to create stories around something interesting, which mortgages are boring. Nobody wants a mortgage, but we all want a home in some way, right? Whether right. it's a house or a, or a condo or whatever you want to call your home, you love your home. So you know, so for me, it was a lot of fun to be able to write about home stuff and tell that story and help home buyers realize their dreams. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun for a few years there at the mortgage company then, too. But you weren't intimidated. I mean, these these things you're doing as you kind of moved around, even though marketing, you never did that. I mean, mm -hmm. these fields, mortgage, that's not really wasn't your area. So were you not intimidated by that? Did you have any hesitations or doubts about going down that path you were unfamiliar with? You know, certainly I was a little bit nervous about it. I mean, you know, when I met with the the owner of the mortgage company and his uh, vice president of sales and, and, and communications and stuff, um, I was a little bit intimidated, a little bit nervous. But, you know, I, I know that I can write a story. I have the, the writing skills and the desire and the passion and all these things, the technical skills, the I've been told I write well, people can read it and enjoy it. So I knew that I had that those chops, right? But I knew that whatever else I needed to figure out, I could be taught. And my thing in marketing is um, <clears throat> I love the idea that marketing is basically having the right conversation with your ideal persona at the right time. And a lot of that conversation is answering their questions, right? They ask, we answer. Um, that's a, a book from a friend of mine, Marcus, that I, I, I love it. I love the philosophy. Uh, we were we were doing that at Amera first and, and it really, it really spoke to me to be able to answer someone's questions and, and help them. And I knew that those, those answers would come from like the sales team, those that were more experienced than me. I just had to translate it from the industry jargon down to an understandable piece of content for our readers. And so, so yeah, a, a little nervous, but certainly not intimidated. I, I don't know if that sounds really cocky or what, but I, no, but I, I, I don't think it's cocky. I think it's interesting. I think it's a, a trait of a dream chaser that, you know, not everyone has. And it's something that we kind of have to build within ourselves, self-belief, confidence, and just the ability to take that chance. Yeah. And, and I mean, I certainly still have that small voice in my head that all of us creatives have of, are you really good enough? You know, when I get to go tell my story, when I'm fortunate to be on on on, on your show, Amy, and talk to the dream chasers and, and, and tell my story, I think, Boy, did, did I tell it well? Does, mm -hmm. does anybody does anybody care? Does this even you know? So that small voice is still there, but I I tend to kind of punch it in the face and just say, look, you know what? I know what I'm doing. I'm good at what I do. I've been able to broaden my scope of marketing to be you know on on national stages at conferences. I've taught uh, realtors how to do this kind of marketing because of the mortgage connection. I've been asked to be in books. Um, people have read my, my book and it just kind of goes, okay, it kind of validates like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Even that small voice is there. I I'm able to kind of shut it down occasionally and, and have that confidence. Cause you know, if, if you can't have confidence chasing your dream, where else can you have it? Right. I love what I'm doing. So I might as well be confident in it. And that's a great, great quote essentially. And, and a great piece of advice because sometimes we don't realize that, you know, it's your dream. It's okay to be confident about it. I, earlier you thought, you know, that might've been cocky, but honestly, I think it's the wrong categorization. You're being confident. Cocky would be bragging about it. You know, you are just, you found a way to do it and you're, you're making it happen. You're doing that. There is a confidence about you, but I got to tell you, after having met you for the first five minutes, uh, I don't think cocky is a word I would use. Well, good. I'm glad I fooled you. I mean, I'm glad I come up. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes, I the wool has been pulled over my eyes, guys. No. I don't know this guy at all. No, no. Uh, but but that's the thing I think with with people today is, you know, they're so nervous to try this path and and find it. You found a way to make your dream work, 
even if it wasn't the initial form or typical form that people expect. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm wondering also, because in, in the intro, you know, in talking about it, you went from TV news business to this. It, what, how do you even go TV news business? How did I get into TV news? Well, yeah. so my other passion other than writing is music. I, I love, love music. The problem is I can't sing <laughs> uh, without hurting people's ears. And I don't have just a natural talent to play an instrument. I'd have to work very, very hard to be good. And so my thought was uh, I, maybe I can be like a music promoter or producer or something where I can listen to music because mm -hmm. I, I feel like I can tell what good music is and where it kind of goes bad and, and what you can do to make it better. I thought music producer, man, that's going to be it. Right. And a friend of mine, uh, Nick is his name and he found a school over in Detroit. So about two and a half hours away from where I live, that was about TV, about TV and radio broadcast arts. And I thought, man, that kind of, you know, radio, that might be a way to get into music. So I, I went over to that school with him and took the the year-long course, and it ended up being not so much about the music, more about the technical side of things, radio and television broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And I just I fell in love with that whole world, though, too. And, and, and the idea, again, of reaching an audience and engaging with people and, and bringing them something. I, I did some radio for a while. I did TV and for longer. Radio ended up being uh, not real lucrative, <laughs> didn't, didn't pay the bills, and it wasn't full-time. What? Um, weird, right? <laughs> Yeah, that that's goes against everything I've heard. Right. It's super glamorous. Nah, yeah, you're in a closet. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I got into I had a part time job at a radio station, part time job at a TV station and TV opportunity to go full time came up first. So I told my, my wife at the time, I said, you know, this is where I need to go is into te television. And I started just being I was a tape editor, literally tape to tape. Um, I know maybe kids listening today don't know what tapes are, but anyway, it's it's um, old it's, score school of medium, guys. <laughs> it is, but yeah, I was I was a, a news editor for the for the evening news, a tape editor, and started doing it for the morning, and then I'm just again, you know, I, I I wanted to be a writer, so I saw the opportunity, went to the news director and said, look, I can write, let me prove it to you. Well, but you didn't go to you know Mizzou, or you're not a journalist, you're not a no. Listen, trust me, test me, and let's do this. And he did. You know, it takes those. Those those folks who have bet on me and it's paid off, I'm very, very grateful for and, and fortunate to have had those over my life here and there. And he was one of them. He took a chance on me. And yeah, so I got into TV news that way. I wasn't some kind of altruistic, I want to be a journalist. It was, I want to pay my bills and I want to do some writing. This looks cool. <laughs> it is great, though, when the two can kind of align. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the people are there for it. But I, I think what's interesting about your story is, you know, Networking, man. I mean, it's the people who have helped you and how you are actually doing that now through interview valet, what that service does. You kind of kind of approach these things and there seems to be that common denom denominator of relationships, which I love. Mm -hmm. and yeah, how, very much so. Right. And how you're helping others and you yourself are being helped through your journey. Yeah. And, and I think that's so important. I think, you know, mentoring, networking, helping others, you know, as as I gain success in my life, I want to look back, reach back, and help others. Um, and I just just a couple of weeks ago actually had a a former coworker from the TV station reach out to me and ask me about marketing. You know, and this is one of those times where he says, "Well, I, I read your book. I'm thinking, you wait, you did? <laughs> That's awesome." And uh, just wanted to talk to me about how my journey was and what he should do and how he's thinking about certain things and does this make sense? What should I do here? And it was very interesting to me that I'm the expert. And it was it was humbling. I was happy to help. I hope it goes well. We're going to have some more conversations. But yeah, that reaching back and helping others because others have helped me, I think, is so important. Didn't that make your day, though, when he said he read your book? Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, Completely. sometimes I think, I, I, you know, when doing the shows, right, these episodes, I'm surprised sometimes by who listens to them, mm. you know, because this isn't like uh entrepreneur on fire or, you know, serial or anything like that. You know, we have a great audience. You guys are fantastic who are listening right now. Um, but you know, the other, the other day, the other week, someone I know came up to me, it was like, oh, that episode you did, that was amazing. I mean, how did mm -hmm. you even get that person? I, and I know I answered his question, but in the back of my mind, really the only thought that was going through my head was, do you actually listen to the show? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, even with your, with your book, 
and the work you're doing. Are you ever amazed, aside from that one time, uh, how many people are impacted by what you're doing? Yeah, I am thrilled and humbled and over the moon when, you know, at Podcast Movement, I reached out to uh, Mike Stelzner from Social Media Examiner and Social Media Marketing Week uh, in San Diego. Mm-hmm. I saw him walk by. I called his name out. He turned around. I introduced myself, and he he knew who I was because of the work that I've done. And I just thought, man, how, who am I that you should know me? It's very humbling. It's very exciting. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. Was it weird? Because I, I think I remember telling you that uh, you were like, yeah, I work with Interview LA, and I'm like, I know them. They're on Twitter. <laughs> I follow exactly. you guys. You guys do some great stuff. <laughs> Yep. Was yeah. that like, really? Yeah, a little. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> At any time, anytime somebody knows who who I am or who our company is or who we are, I mean, I shouldn't be like, I'm not shocked. We we do our work to connect, sure. but I'm always I'm always very happy. I'm always uh, a little bit humbled. You know, gosh, okay, the work we're doing is good. That's awesome. So I think I think it goes back to earlier. You know, about uh, confidence that you were talking about. Sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we do. You know, it comes in different forms. It it presents itself in different moments because sometimes you're just like, yeah, I'm good. I can do this. And then somebody will ask you a question and you're surprised that they receive it well, that, you yeah. know, that they're, and you're like, that's the kind of when that self doubt is like, oh yeah, it's not gone forever. Yep. You know, and, and do you face that now that you're the inbound evangelist, do you find you have a little bit of a imposter syndrome? Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny that you ask that because there are times when I'll say to my, my wife now and, and or my kids, you know, that they keep me very humble and it's like, okay, we're going to sit here in my, in my house with my kittens and my motorcycle. I'm going to go for a ride and everything. And then I think, wait a minute, I can be on a national stage telling the story and helping others. Or I had a, a large credit union from around here call me and ask me to come speak to, to their CMO talking about inbound marketing. And so there are times when I feel like, yeah, who who am I to be that expert? Why am I? Not that it's less often, but uh, that that confidence tends to, as I'm validated, it tends to grow a little bit. So, but yeah, I still think there are times when I'm an imposter. What am I doing here? <laughs> and that's that's the thing, because you you're such a strong dream chaser. Um, just in talking with you before having you on the show, you know, I can hear it, I can see it, and to know that you even go through that. It's a very humbling thing, so to speak. I think some people need to hear that. It's not uncommon to go through that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's com- yeah, completely normal. And, you know, I don't and, and I've talked to uh, men and women who are much more well known than me. And the same thing, you know, they still they still have to be validated at times of, no, you aren't, you do know what you're doing. And this is why. And it's like, OK, yeah, that little voice. It's just that subconscious little I don't know what it is. That little voice is such a little, a little jerk, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So I got to ask you something because in the intro, you know, I did share it, but I did have a question about it. And I made a note. I was like, I got to ask him what that means. What is servant leadership? What does that mean? So there's a million articles probably that explain it. But for me, what it means, a very personal side of it is, I'm a faith person. I'm I'm Christian. Uh, I, I read my Bible, and I believe in the the Proverbs, this kind of stuff, right? And there's a there's a verse in in Matthew chapter 20 that says uh, that that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve others. And that's what I look at as you know, if if he's the leader of this faith, and he could have come down, you know, come come to the earth from heaven and demanded to be served, and and he's the creator, so he he deserves it, right? Instead, he comes and he helps and he serves others. He walks with with uh, you know invalids and and does all these things to serve them in order to lead them. And I, and I I go back to that as my one of my core beliefs. But in practice, what it looks like to me is. Uh, just helping others. You know, I don't want to lead by telling people what to do. I don't want to, as a as a manager of a marketing department or now as, as CMO at Interview Valet, I don't want to have people, you know, quote unquote, under me that only do what I say. What I want to do is serve them to make them more successful. And whether that means giving them the right tools, helping them with uh, figuring out their own strategy, uh, you know, giving them what they need, understanding them, showing empathy, um, I'm not everybody's friend. If I'm your boss, I'm not your friend necessarily, right? 
we have to have lines drawn, but I'm going to show empathy. I'm going to try to understand where you're coming from, whether it's a personal matter or your opinion about um, how how to do SEO or whatever it is. Sure. Right? I want I want to have that empathy. And so, to me, the everyday practice of living out that servant leadership is just to help others be more successful, uh, what, whoever they are, in order to lead others to the right path, I guess. I love that concept. I've never heard it expressed that way. I never, I've never heard of servant leadership, but, but mm-hmm. I love that because I think it's very powerful. I also, I, I had this thought um, the other day when a friend of mine had come back from the store and was talking about how you know, she believes everyone should work in retail Mm. at least once. Right. Cause it's a very, uh, service oriented career, right? Whether you're the cashier or you're the one helping the person you're helping someone else. Mm. And so it's interesting to me that, you know, this sounds like it's that kind of a concept that leaders, uh, can be built if they, if they are able to serve others, in a, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't really matter what capacity, right? The whole concept, and correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be helping others, serving others in your role and serving those under you. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think one of the one of the biggest proponents of this right now uh, is Simon Sinek. Yes. And, and, and besides his amazing uh, um, accent. <laughs> <laughs> Stumble over my words here a little bit. Uh, I love different accents. I'm so Midwest that I love anybody's accent. Anyway, uh, besides that, Simon, I, I, I love what he says in his book, Leaders Eat Last. He likens it to, to military, and he, he talks about how an officer will not go in to the lunch line, the child line, first. They'll stand back and let their, their men and women eat first, so leaders eat last. And, and that, is just, that, that has stuck with me since I read that book, and I thought, man, that is so important. I'm not going to walk into a room and say, okay, I'm in charge. Let's do this. It's I'm going to walk in and, and rely on others. I want to surround myself with people who are smarter than me, who are better than me, who are more driven than me, and I'm going to serve them uh, in some other, in some aspects. So I, yeah, I think Simon hits the nail on the head too. Have you always had that mentality of servant leadership or was there something that switched, uh, flipped the switch for you? Um, <clears throat> you know, I'd like to say that I've always kind of had it subconsciously. I'm, I'm, not, I've never really thought about that though. I, and maybe not and just the, didn't label it. Yeah, I mean, I've always, yeah, I've always liked to help others and teach others. At one point in my life, I thought I might be a teacher, and I, you know, there, as much as I think of myself as a writer, I also kind of think of myself as an educator right now in marketing because I prefer educational marketing. So I've always kind of thought about that in a way. And I got, and you know, teachers, a, a great teacher is definitely a servant leader. I think. But I, I only in the last few years did I really begin to understand what that meant and be able to label it. When I was at uh, Amerifirst at the at the mortgage company, I was very fortunate to be able to go through a couple of years of leadership training because the company wanted me to as one of its managers and leaders. And, it, and so there's a group of us going through it. And when that concept began to rise to the top, I thought, man, I just that's it. Like, that's me. That's who I want to be. That's who I think I am. That's who I'm going to strive to be. And so it was only in the last maybe four years that I've really kind of labeled it as such. Oh, that's wonderful. Because I'm curious to, to think about how that has helped you in chasing your dreams. Because your mentality is different from someone who doesn't have that. Yeah. And I, and I think it plays out in things like networking. Um, you know, my, my network has helped me be successful, but I didn't build a network to take from them. I've built a network around me of people that I want to help. And, you know, if they help me at some point, great. If not, I've helped somebody else. That's okay. I want to network to give, not to, not to receive. So, you know, and I I guess I can credit my parents uh, for that one. It's better to give than to receive. Right. And I've got great parents that taught me that. So um, thanks mom and dad, Uh, (laughs) you know, shout outs to moms and dads for their, (laughs) for their abilities. Exactly. But yeah, I think, you know, that's, that played out long ago in my life of networking the right way just because I, I don't want to be a taker. I want to be a giver. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, it's not that everyone could go to the store and buy that. And it's not mm-hmm. like you can rewind your childhood and rewind and, and do, start doing that. So what would you suggest to someone who's listening today? Cause you know, shout outs to anyone who under the age of 16 that is listening to this, but uh, you know, for those who are kind of further in life, you know, 
stopped mm-hmm. being raised by their parents, or I guess you can't be stopped. Parents are always <laughs> raising you, but you don't understand what I'm saying. Like if you yeah. are further in life, how could we kind of develop this? Is it as easy as saying, just do it? Uh, it's, I think with anything, it's going to be work, but there's, it's never too late. Um, you know, you could be, you know, 75 years old and have been a successful CEO and think, okay, now I want to serve and lead through servant leadership and start a nonprofit to help the homeless or something. I mean, there's, it's never too late. I think, um, I would say anyone who's intrigued by it, first of all, awareness is number one, right? Self-awareness and being aware of what you want is, is the first key to that. And so I would say, be, just begin by, you know, even just reading Simon's book or getting it on, on Audible or something, read, you know, get to know Simon Sinek and what he talks about, and then just begin to kind of develop that hunger for servant leadership. I certainly don't think it's that difficult to change and become that because once you see the benefits of it to the world around you, it's addictive almost. It's really, it's really powerful. It's almost like a, not just like a light bulb going off. It, Cause I think it's a little bit more powerful and brighter than that. Right. Uh, when it happens, when you do that and I have to second his recommendation of, of reading Simon Sinek's books, he actually just came out with a new one. Finding your why I think is what it's called. Mm. And mm-hmm. I recommend you listen to that just because his, he's on Ted talks, he's, you know, doing the stuff, but it's very powerful. Once you kind of find your why, which is kind of one of the principles, the golden rule that he talks about, everything changes. Like, doesn't it really does. Doesn't it change? Did it change for you? Like everything seemed to change for me once I figured out my why. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I credit Simon with that too. I mean, I, I heard him speak on it and, and actually there was a group at at Amerifirst that uh, started a why committee um, to help others find their why. And yeah, it just, it changed for me. It was like, okay, yeah. You know, I've always, I've always wanted to make a difference in the world in some way, but when I started to really think about my my why and what it is and and what I want to do about my life and and what legacy I want to leave behind um, for my kids, for future generations, whatever, um, and it's a bit of an ego thing for sure, you know, I want to leave a legacy, but it's not it's not to be famous, it's to to help others, and yeah, that that why changed it for me. It really did. And I mean. Dan, you're, you're, you're happy right now, right? You're living your dream, even though oh, yeah. you're still working on it and it's still evolving. It sounds like, but you, you seem to credit that as one of the things to lead towards it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll always be chasing my dreams. I'll never not be a dream chaser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's always changing or evolving or growing. You know, my, my dream for 10 years from now is different than what it was 10 years ago. And I'm going to chase that dream now and it's, it's going to happen, right? It's, you know, I want to be able to travel at 50 rather than wait until I'm retired, um, you know, and be, you know, 75 and too old to, to hike. I want to be able to travel at 50 and work remotely and, and, and spread the gospel of as the inbound evangelist and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and make a living at it. Right. And take my family with me and that kind of thing. So I'm always chasing my dreams, but it, yeah, finding your why is definitely what I think gets you there. I'm really glad you said that one that you'll always be chasing your dream. Cause I think sometimes people are so focused on the end, you know, that goal that it's like, was it, was that really it? Are you done? (laughs) It just, it seems to, I mean, people who are true dream chasers or who really understand, I mean, everyone's a dream chaser if you're chasing your dream, but those who seem to get it, understand that this is a, not a, it's not a 5k. Mm. It's just a, it's a marathon that just keeps on going, sometimes doesn't end. But the point is, you know, you're having fun and you're enjoying it. It's evolving. It's changing. And that has happened. I mean, from our conversation, it's happened with, with you already multiple times. Do you foresee it happening again? You think changing to something else? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I, I love what I'm doing and I love that I've gotten to this point of a, in, a, in a professional career I can say I've kind of reached sort of the the top of that bracket or that 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 career, uh, but there's more. I mean, I never considered myself an entrepreneur until I started working with an entrepreneur as his kind of partner, and now I, I see it. I'm like, oh man, I want to do that. I want to I want to create something for people to be able to help them and change their world in some way. And I'm not looking to be the next entrepreneur who sells their idea to uh, you know venture capitalists for a billion dollars. 
as much. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't say no <laughs> necessarily, but that's not why, right? My why is to help others and make a difference in the world and, and leave the world a little bit better than what I found it. And so if I can be an entrepreneur next, that might be a, a dream that I chase. Um, yeah. I love it. I love it. Dan, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Before we let you go though, I mean, there's been so many things that people can take away, but I'm going to ask you, what is one thing you would tell a dream chaser to do today in chasing their dreams? You know, I was thinking about this quite a bit after listening to some of your other episodes and I thought, man, I got to have something really, really good. Hopefully this is it. Um, <laughs> I, I want to tell all the dream chasers, be a part of mentoring because if you can give back to those who are, you know, quote behind you and look to those ahead of you to even help you further, it's, it's very rewarding. Uh, it opens up new doors that you never knew existed. It's an effective way to network, which is good, but not to be greedy about it. Uh, mentorship is a huge thing. And again, that leaves the world a better place than when you started. And, it, and you, and I want to be in the middle of mentoring. I want to have mentors that, uh, that, that give to me, that, that help me. And then I want to give to, to mentees, right? Because it's a, it's a circular thing. I mean, even the mentors that help me have told me you've given me more than I've given you. And so it becomes this really cool ecosystem of just giving. And, and so, yeah, mentorship, that's the key to chasing your dreams, I think. I love that. I love that because it, it hits on so many things. But, you know, I don't think people understand the power of mentoring and giving back and how much you're rewarded, even though you're doing the work for someone else. Mm -hmm. There's just and you're right. It does make the world a better place. So Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your story, all those nuggets of wisdom. We'd love it. And I can't wait to check in on you and see how things are progressing down the road. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And if anybody does want to kind of you know hear more about Chasing My Dream, uh, the book that I mentioned, um, I'll put up a free chapter on interviewvalley.com forward slash chasing dreams. So all your dream chasers can go grab one of those uh, and they can even download the actual the full book if they want to. There's a link for that, too. Um, on my website, but yeah, they can, you know, anybody wants to be a little, hopefully inspired a little bit, please go, go check out that chapter look at the book and, and chase those dreams for sure. All right, guys, that was Dan Boyle and what an awesome guy, right? A fantastic dream chaser. Sounds like he's been doing it from the very beginning at a young age and consistently chasing his dream, even though it has changed numerous times. I love that. I love what he's doing. And I hope you guys took some inspiration from that, uh, from his recommendation to listening and finding out about Simon Sinek and what he's doing, his offer to download the first chapter of his book and his book. Okay. So all of that stuff you guys can find on the show notes page over at chasingdreamshq.com slash episode 110. That's episode 110. Okay. And until next time, guys, keep chasing. Thank you so much for listening to Chasing Dreams. Amy would love to connect with you and hear all about your pursuit of chasing your dreams. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram via at Chasing Dreams HQ. Or you can find Amy on Twitter at AmyJ21. That's A-I-M-E-E-J-2-1. Be sure to visit headquarters over at ChasingDreamsHQ.com for more inspiration, motivation, and resources to help with your own dream chase. We hope you'll join Amy next week. And until then, keep chasing.